So it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to welcome everyone to this uh, of annual, annual, I'm going to explain why that is a falsehood, uh, conference of the Constitutional Law Center. Uh, it's a falsehood because we haven't been able to do this since uh, 2019. And so that's why it's su I can say it is such a pleasure to be, uh, uh, I hope, over uh, this dark period and into a time when we can gather like this uh, uh, more frequently. And, and I, I wonder if that's part of the explanation for why uh, we had s acceptances from so many great people from around the country, and I just feel excited and proud to be uh, a part of the organization here. I say part because Jed, who's going to speak for just a, a second right after this, uh, he and I have co-organized this. Uh, uh, Jed, and, uh, so we basically divided uh, the, the tasks. He did most of the work along with Morgan Weiland, my executive director, and I arranged for the weather. Uh, so it's up to you to decide who, who made the uh, better uh, contribution to this uh, uh, conference. Uh, Jed and I bonded over disagreeing sometimes pretty strongly on some of the issues that we have here. And I want to mention that because <coughs> some of you students and younger scholars may not be aware that this is something we used to do in academia, is disagree strongly and bond as a result of the uh, experience. And I hope uh, that the conference uh, today and tomorrow will exhibit uh, some of that old-fashioned uh, uh, belief that uh, through you know, serious, scholarly, civil, good faith uh, discussion that we can approach uh, somewhere, somewhat closer to the truth than any of our uh, uh, meager brains uh, may have. I'm going to take just a personal note, though, because um, uh, and, we're, and recognize and thank Gerhard Casper for being uh, among us, not because he was the distinguished pre uh, president of Stanford University, though he was, but because he was my first constitutional law professor from whom I f in, uh, first got an introduction to many of the topics that we're going to be talking uh, about today, and so it is just a uh, a thrill for me to have him uh, attending here. Uh, our topic is presidential power. I'm going to get out of the way now and uh, uh, give the, the uh, uh, microphone to Jed and then uh, to the panel. Great. Well, thank you, Michael, for, for those comments. And, and Michael, uh, also thank you for, I think, the, this is the design of this conference was uh, this ver these very contrasting views uh, that take law and history seriously. We, Michael and I started talking in, right after the pandemic started uh, when we were talking about the first Congress. And uh, we had very different views, but had a great conversation that was generative. And so I think the idea of this conference is that it comes out of uh, very different views across the political, legal, and methodological spectrum, having that conversation happen here. So thank you all for, for being here from and representing all lots of, of different perspectives and methodologies, and also for continuing this conversation after this, this conference. I think that's part of what we need more in academia and in America is the willingness to engage across the spectrum um, in, with, with, attributed, in good faith, attributing good faith to all sides. That's the point here. And I think one other note I'd like to make is, you know, as people looked at, and, and I shared the roster of this uh, conference um, in different formats, uh, people responded that this is like the Coachella of Article 2. I would just say maybe it's the Lala pa Article 2 Um It's more my generation. Um, and I'm, so I thank you all for, for uh, bringing your, uh, your skill, your wisdom, your expertise, and your generosity. And Michael, I want to just end with uh, Michael's generosity here to host this conference and put the work in and, uh, and put the resources in, including the beautiful weather. So, so thank you to Michael, and thank you to all of you. I'll, I'll see you on the panel soon. Well, uh, I'm David Kennedy, and I have the uh, distinction, or maybe I should say the disadvantage, of being one of the very few people, maybe the only person in this room who is not a constitutional scholar. But, and I know it's uh, inadequate compensation for that deficiency, but I can tell you that I do know how to count. And we have something approaching 85 minutes between now and lunch, and I will count them off and be sure we all get to lunch on time. But displaying my uh, prowess in the realm of counting, I'd like to begin the conversation this morning with a few numbers. 
And these are all very elemental, but I think they point to some very difficult issues at the heart of this day's discussion as well as tomorrow's. There have been 46 presidencies, but only 45 presidents, thanks to the singular way that we count the non-consecutive presidencies of Grover Cleveland. Uh, all presidents have been males. All but three have been white Protestant males. 17 have been reelected to a second term, barely one third of all the presidents, which facially at least suggests something about the fickleness and volatility of our political system. Eight have died in office, four of them assassinated. Five have been elected without a popular majority. That's J.Q. Adams, Rutherford Hayes, Benjamin Harrison, Bush II, and Donald Trump. Three have been impeached, none convicted. Uh, and in all those numbers, the one I want to call out for your attention that I think will be the focus not only of this initial discussion but the discussion for the next two days <coughs> is the number one. Because of the 536 federally elected officials in Washington, D.C., counting the vice president as together with the president, of the 536 people elected to federal office in Washington, D.C., <coughs> only one is saddled with or uh, endowed with the, the responsibilities for the nation as a whole, not just responsible to a constituency in a given geographic area like a state or a congressional district. That, that of course, is the President of the United States. And the singularity, literally, uh, of that uh, position has been controversial from the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia to the spring of 2022 here in Palo Alto. And that's why we're still discussing this contentious matter about the singularity of this office 235 years later. Uh, Theodore White, the great chronicler of presidential elections beginning in 1960 and for several cycles thereafter, once put this deeply controversial point in a very homely way. He said, the supreme duty of the President of the United States is to protect us from each other's congressmen. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was a joke, but it, but it sums up something quite essential, that the President is the one person in our electoral system that is invested with the authority to look out for the nation as a whole and not just for at a given constituency defined geographically. I'll end with one last set of numbers before passing the microphone to uh, Eric Nelson. Uh, that is, uh, we've already heard about the fact that we're talking about Article 2. I simply want to call our attention to the fact of the sequence of the Constitution, that Article 2 is the second article. The first article of the Constitution, of course, deals with the legislature. It contains 51 paragraphs. Well, Article 2 contains 13 paragraphs, which again, I think, just on the face of it, conveys some sense about where the founders thought the center of gravity of the political system should be. And I know that's a controversial statement, and I know we'll hear other views as we go on, but I'll stop here. Uh, on our way to lunch, we have the next uh, roughly uh, 80 minutes or so to discuss these matters, and Eric, would you like to take over? Uh, sure. Can everyone hear me? Is this on? Yeah, great. Um, well, first of all, um, let me thank uh, uh, Jed and, uh, and Michael and uh, uh, everyone who's organized this and, uh, uh, and all of you for coming. It's, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me uh, because uh, I actually haven't worked on this material in quite a long time. And so it was, uh, it was really a genuine pleasure to, uh, to jump back in and, uh, and have the chance to think about some of these questions again um, after a long hiatus uh, in, uh, in such uh, extraordinary company. So I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion. Um, we've been sworn to 10 minute maximums uh, for our, uh, our preliminary remarks and I, I'm gonna keep to it. So I'm just going to say uh, something uh, very much um, uh, by way of a sketch of, um, uh, of uh, what I was trying to get at in the paper uh, that uh, that you looked at, uh, and uh, and then to just uh, focus in on what I think are a couple of problems that uh, that it uh, uh, that it uh, sort of calls our attention to, and that in some form or another I think will be with us for the rest of the conference. Um, so the the basic um, jumping off point of the analysis, uh, you might say, um, uh, comes from uh, an exchange uh, that takes place. Uh, at this famous moment on the 1st of June, 1787, uh, when uh, James Wilson in the convention rises and uh, makes the motion uh, 
uh, that would create the presidency. Uh, and uh, the wording that he used, right, is the executive should consist of a single person. Uh, and um, uh, very famously, uh, this is followed, um, as Madison reports, by a pause uh, as the delegates are trying to absorb this. Uh, and uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, things that I want to talk about a little um, is uh, why the pause, um, what was so striking about this. Uh, and one of the things I think uh, would have been striking to everyone in that audience um, is the actual formulation, the executive uh, in a single person, because the term single person um, was a well-known phrase uh, at this point in English constitutional history. Uh, and it had a very particular pedigree. It's the language that was used uh, by the Rump Parliament uh, in 1649 uh, when it abolishes the office of king. Uh, it's the language used in the oath of engagement. Um, and uh, the idea is the new English Commonwealth is a regime without single person. Um, without single person or house of peers in the final, uh, in the final version. Uh, and uh, so this is a, a repudiation of that, of that legacy, no, no single person. Uh, and the other highly resonant part of the phrase, uh, it's also uh, the, uh, exactly the same formulation that Blackstone uses, uh, the executive power in a single person. Uh, but it's also the formulation that John Adams had used uh, in uh, his defense of the constitutions of government, uh, which had been published to coincide with uh, the beginnings of the convention in Philadelphia, and which despite lots of um, uh, sort of misunderstanding about its early reception was enormously important and read uh, by virtually everyone uh, in Philadelphia. Um, Adams, uh, in that work, uh, which they were all reading on the eve of the convention, uh, writes, by kings and kingly power is meant the executive power in a single person. Right, so the, exec the exact same phrase right, um, being used uh, to define monarchy, uh, which is what explains what happens next, namely uh, that Edmund Randolph of Virginia gets up uh, and objects, uh, declaring uh, as he says, that a unity in the, the executive magistracy would amount to a fetus of monarchy, uh, and uh, insisting that the Americans, uh, having uh, just rebelled against the British crown, uh, would be crazy to put themselves uh, back under some species of monarchical government. To which Wilson responds, uh, as reported in the notes of Rufus King, uh, that um, he disagrees with the characterization uh, for any number of reasons. He has a whole number of things to say. Uh, but he particularly takes aim at the claim about the relationship between uh, the proposal and the legacy and purposes of the revolution. Uh, and he responds as follows. He says, the people of America did not oppose the British king, but the parliament. The opposition was not against a unity, but against a corrupt multitude. So what my paper is really about is that, about this debate uh, amongst people present in Philadelphia, this very divergent set of understandings about what the revolution was about uh, that informed the positions that they were respectively taking about the new chief magistracy. Uh, you had people arguing uh, that the revolution was anti-monarchical and were therefore uh, defending very Whiggish uh, principles that were very suspicious of executive power, and you had others uh, like Wilson, like Hamilton, uh, like Governor Morris, like um, uh, Charles Pinckney and others, uh, who were taking uh, exactly the opposing view, arguing uh, that actually if you want to keep faith with revolution principles, uh, you'll create a very strong chief magistrate, and I try to lay out uh, some of the, uh, uh, the reasons they had for thinking this, and to try to connect this moment at the founding with the imperial crisis, with the, uh, the sort of ideological developments that took place in British America uh, in the later 1760s and early 1770s. So that's basically what I'm trying to talk about. Um, and I'm, uh, and uh, I, I won't say any more about it just because I've, I've been sworn to a 10 minute maximum. Uh, so let me just flag a couple of problems. Um, one is the problem of uh, fundamental disagreement or what we might call the problem of overlapping consensus. So uh, I take it as given, and I think everyone um, you'll be hearing from takes it as given, that the founders thought exactly nothing 
about executive power. I mean, that's to say, we're talking about people with an enormously wide array of views who disagreed with each other very sharply. They not only disagreed about what should be in and what should be out, but they also agreed, disagreed fundamentally about why the things sh that should be in should be in. Uh, so uh, you could, for instance, just to take the famous example, uh, you had people arguing that the veto of the president should be qualified, that is subject to an override provision, because they were interested in weakening it, making it less monarchical. And you had others uh, who uh, supported qualifying the veto by making it uh, subject to override in order to strengthen it, uh, in, in line with Hamilton's famous argument uh, in The Federalist, which was also made by Wilson. So um, one of the major problems uh, is that the Constitution is, uh, is of course, in, the final, in its final form, uh, a, um, a sort of uh, hammered out compromise between people of extremely different views and people who were defending the very same provisions for very different reasons, and that's one source of difficulty. The other source of difficulty, which I want to flag, um, uh, and which I think will come up over and over again, uh, is the question, uh, since so much of, uh, of our discussion in the conference and so much of the discussion in Philadelphia uh, uh, in relation to the uh, establishment of the chief magistracy was about its relation to the British crown and, about, uh, and, its, uh, and the relationship between the powers given to the president and the royal prerogatives, the prerogatives of the English monarch, um, the enormous problem is getting any kind of consensus about what those were. Um, and this for several reasons, but I just want to, you know, flag one of them. So, for instance, a lot um, uh, will be made quite rightly uh, throughout the conference of the enormous influence of Blackstone's um, famous sort of listing of the prerogatives of the crown uh, in the deliberations and the idea to allocate these different prerogatives to, uh, to different branches, but basically treating them as the list. However, Blackstone himself um, was emphatically clear that the list of prerogatives he was giving was a list as a matter of law and not as a matter of political practice because his basic premise uh, was that the two 17th century revolutions and the Whig ascendancy uh, in the early 18th century had produced a situation in which in practice the monarch wielded far fewer of these prerogatives and he fully accepted the view that had been most famously defended by David Hume uh, that um, what had come to substitute for the actual prerogatives of the crown that existed as a matter of law and which no English monarch had actually wielded in generations was influence. That is, the ability of the monarch to command uh, a parliamentary majority through uh, the use of patronage and gifts. Eric, I interrupt only to remind you of your sacred oath and you have two minutes left. Well, lucky for you, that was where I was coming in for a landing. Uh, so, uh, so figuring out um, not just what counted as a prerogative of the crown, but whether something that, uh, that did and was taken by consensus to uh, remain as a legal matter, a prerogative of the crown, had anything at all to do with the power of the king uh, was a major problem uh, and a source of difficulty that I think we'll be coming back to over and over again. And with that, I'll come in for my promised landing. Thank you. Michael, I believe you're next up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was the conventional wisdom until maybe Eric's book uh, caused so much of, uh, of a reformation in our thinking, but I think it was the conventional wisdom for a long time, and especially in the judiciary, uh, that the American founding simply rejected the monarchy sort of uh, root and branch so that it, one sees in judicial opinions the, an argument of the following form. Well, if that claim for the modern American presidency were true, that would be like the king, and that was the end of the argument. We see that argument in, uh, uh, in Justice Jackson's a concurrence in, uh, uh, in the steel seizure case when he rejects the uh, substantive interpretation of the vesting clause saying the, uh, the institution that that would most remind the framers of was the king and that was pretty much his, uh, his refutation of that argument. Even very recently, uh, a district judge uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, in her opinion in United States versus McGahn, says, well, if the president were able to shield uh, 
his uh, White House counsel uh, from being subpoenaed to testify to a House of Congress on a l legislative matter, uh, well, that would make him like a king. And so that was the argument against that uh, uh, proposition. So that's been, I think, the conventional wisdom. I think uh, Professor Nelson has introduced a very different way of looking at it, which is uh, to, to think that perhaps uh, the, the framers in Philadelphia were deliberately moving back in a monarchical direction. Um, and I would like to present, I think it's kind of a, a middle ground position, although I, I'm probably closer to, to Eric on this than I am to the judges I've just uh, uh, mentioned. But that is that they understood the problems of the executive as coming uh, from the monarchy. That is, that's where they got their ideas uh, their menu of possible powers, uh, but that their view was that some of those powers would be dangerous. They thought some of those powers would be highly desirable in a new president, and they thought some of those powers would be either uh, contrary to the Republican sensibilities of the American people or perhaps inconsistent with the circumstances of America. And so I think that what we see at Philadelphia is a much more discriminating use of, uh, of royal powers or the menu of royal powers in order to construct a presidency that was going to be able to achieve many of the um, virtues of a, of a single person uh, in charge, energy, dispatch, secrecy, uh, 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 but without the extensive suite of powers that made such a person uh, a dangerous uh, to liberty. And so I, that's the basic thesis of, uh, of the, uh, a book that I've recently published called The President Who Would Not Be King. He would not be king precisely because uh, the powers were structured in some way and in significant ways to be short of an, uh, uh, the, the dangerous degree of, of royal power. Um, how did that take place? Well, the original Virginia plan uh, did not uh, have a very well thought out vision of the executive. Instead, it just dumped all of the traditional uh, executive powers that had been exercised by Congress under the uh, Confederation government in this new executive, plus the power to uh, carry the laws into execution, which no one interestingly had under the Confederacy. It was mostly left to the states. Um, and, and beyond that, it just wasn't very thought through. And immediately, uh, Charles Pinckney points out that this would include you know, extraordinarily broad powers. Like, that would mean that the president could take us into war uh, or, or peace unilaterally. Right? And, 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 then, and then one of my favorite little details is the, the et cetera, the little uh, ampersand mark that, uh, uh, that uh, Madison uses. Peace and war, et cetera, which, and I think the et cetera is a, um, a shorthand for all of the list of prerogative powers that the, that the king uh, had. And in any event, this immediately causes a commotion leading Wilson to make the statement that Professor Nelson has already quoted, that the prerogatives of the king should not be uh, the, the pattern. It leads R Rutledge to say, oh, I don't favor giving the president the powers of peace and war. Uh, and then after Madison makes a really intelligent middle ground intervention that's rejected, um, the, the, on June 4th, they adopt a presidency with only three carefully divined enumerated powers. That is the power to carry law into execution, the power to make some but not all appointments, and then the, uh, the, the uh, a limited veto power. And that's how it rests for a month and a half in Philadelphia. No change, no debate, no nothing. And then Wilson and Rutledge and a few others uh, get appointed, get themselves appointed, I think is probably more accurate, although we don't really know, uh, to uh, the Committee of Detail, with Rutledge as the apparent chair. Uh, and they then do exactly what 
they seem to have said back on June 1st. That is, they do think about the prerogative powers of the king, but they don't let them be a template for the new executive. But it is, we don't actually have any records of why they did what they did, but we do have pretty good records of what they did. And so I think we can infer from what they did what their method must have been because suddenly, they, in their much more detailed version of a constitution, almost all of the prerogative powers which are listed by Blackstone from the British tradition are explicitly addressed in the new constitution, but they are not all given to the president. Um, according to one count by William uh, Winslow Krosky, former uh, professor, very controversial former law professor at University of Chicago, and I'm gesturing toward Gerhard because uh, he's the first person who acquainted me with Krosky way back when. Uh, so uh, according to his count, some 13 of the enumerated powers of Congress out of the 26 that are given in the uh, uh, Constitution were actually prerogative powers of the king, things like coining money and raising armies and uh, building uh, fortresses and commanding the militia and, and, and a, number of, a number of them, uh, not commanding but, but being able to call forth the militia uh, to, uh, 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 to fight. Uh, and then some of the prerogative powers are given to the president, although I would stress, I don't know, I don't have time really to talk about this today, but I would stress that each of the uh, enumerated prerogative powers that are expressly given to the president is actually whittled down in scope uh, from what uh, the king had under the, uh, under the uh, British Constitution. Then some of the prerogative powers are either left to the states or the people or are just you know, eliminated altogether. No one, for example, in our government uh, is the supreme head of the national church. No one in our government can create titles of nobility. So they eliminate some of the prerogative powers uh, altogether. And then they add a vesting clause uh, there had been a vesting clause of sorts in the Virginia plan and it had been eliminated. Now they bring back a vesting clause, uh, which uh, it is my argument, and this is I think where uh, Julian and I probably most, close, uh, most nearly disagree, uh, is that I believe that this is a, uh, a grant of the uh, executive powers that were not elsewhere uh, allocated. So, you have to subtract from executive powers everything that's given to Congress, uh, and, and that's basically uh, what's left. And, and the effect of that is that the, whatever residual executive powers there might be are not constitutionally vested in the, in the president in the usual sense of the word, because whenever Congress has an enumerated power, and exercises that, that that trumps whatever the president has done. Not because the Congress is like in some uh, ontological sense superior, but because the idea of residual powers under the vesting clause is that all that they consist of is what's left after Congress exercises its own uh, enumerated powers. So that's the basic uh, 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 scheme that I believe that the uh, that the framers uh, uh, came up with. And, uh, and with that, I will uh, subside, I think having kept my sacred oath. Right, right on the mark. Julian? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you so much to the organizers um, and to my co-panelists um, for the chance to be part of this conversation. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a Stanford Law grad. Uh, the chance to be here and speaking at the place I went to school is pretty special. Um, and so, hello, and, uh, uh, and, and many thanks all around. Um, having said that, my plan now, I think, is to make a whole bunch of different people in the room mad with me um, for different reasons. I mean, hopefully not actually mad. Um, in talking about uh, what the little snippet that you guys have read comes from and is part of. Um, for the last 10 years or so, I've been working um, in uh, archival research in the 17th, 18th century background, political theory, legal treatise um, materials from the same period of time, um, 
trying, in the first instance, to try to figure out a relatively narrow question, and the thing has just sort of grown and grown and grown, with the final result that the goal of the project, the book project, on hold for two years during COVID, but turning back to it now, so this is a nice chance, um, it aims to offer an account for the best understanding of the institutional presidency um, that emerged from, uh, I mean, not only the, uh, the drafting in Philadelphia, but from the ratification. And um, here's the place where I think I'm going to make people like Jonathan Gnapp and John McHyle cross with me. Um, it seems clear to me from the materials that I've read that a relatively serious and strict sense of formalist enumerationism was really important to the founding generation, at least when it came to structural questions and in particular presidential power. I mean, uh, Jonathan, uh, my colleague Richard Primus would throw a tomato at me if he was here. Um, John have powerfully argued that there's reason to think that this frame might not hold throughout the Constitution, that some of the traditional Federalist frame for enumerationism might simply be missing some really important stuff about the structure of the Constitution. Um, and I'm uh, at least persuaded that they've complicated the question. I do think that when it comes to executive power, the reiteration and recursion to the point that the powers that the president had were there on the face of the document. What snake in the grass is there here? Is one of my favorite lines to capture this idea during ratification debates in which people are screaming king at every turn. So what happens if you take that seriously? We turn back here, I think, to David's observation at the beginning. Article two is only I didn't know it was 13 paragraphs long, but I'm going to take that at, take it as word. 13 paragraphs long, and most of that, not literally most, but uh, the, the largest single thing, and something close to 50%, is process, how he as, or she eventually, uh, one day, gets elected. Um, there just isn't that much there by way of affirmative grant of power to the president, right? There's the executive power in the first sentence, there's the treaty power. Um, there's the appointment power, you can receive ambassadors, you can pardon, um, commander in chief, I'm forgetting something, but there's not that much there. And so when you ask what can the president do, there's two possibilities. One possibility is the president can do something that a particular clause in the Constitution allows the president to do. Can the president welcome the French ambassador into his office? Yes, the president can do that because the Constitution authorizes him to do so. Can the president nominate with advice and consent, et cetera? Yes, because the Constitution says so. Anything that's not expressly stated in the Constitution, however, isn't available to the president absent a statute authorizing that action. The idea uh, functionally is we push forward the complex questions about the best structuring of structural aspects of federal governance to the political process over time. Um, this is a creative generation. This is a generation that's come through a remarkable ferment in the 1780s. Um, I'm less familiar with the full you know, archival background of the 1770s, but 1780s is this wildly creative time in the states, um, in the Continental Congress, where they're just trying everything out. And so this spirit of trying stuff out is, carries forward, in my view anyway, in the structure of the presidency, where um, the president doesn't get much constitutionally specified, but what's specified actually is his or hers. Here comes the key point, the executive power. Um, it's, I think it's fair to say traditionally been thought, traditionally been argued. Um, uh, actually, there's quite a bit to say about the historiography of this, but certainly the dominant view in the last 50 odd years is that the executive power includes to some extent the affirmative prerogatives of the crown, except as elsewhere modified in the constitution. Um, I have, uh, uh, written two papers arguing, and I'm not going to fully, I mean, I can't possibly substantiate them here, the, the, the evidence either <laughs> wins you over or it doesn't, um, but trying to figure out how they use this phrase, the executive power. And it seems very, very clear to me that there was actually consensus and sort of almost unstated, um, there would be unstated surprise at the suggestion that the phrase the executive power could mean anything other than the power to execute. It could either mean powers associated with the executive or the power to execute. And it pretty plainly means the very thin enforcement authority that the second formulation identifies. Now, one of the really interesting things is I absolutely agree with Eric that there's massive disagreement about 
listen carefully, executive power. There is not massive disagreement about the executive power, least of all where executive power is combined in an analytical troika with executive, legislative, and judicial power. So they agree on the terminology. It's, it's, it is, I expected when I first turned to these questions, given the consensus that emerges in the literature, um, I expected to see, like, I thought I was gonna tell a dissensus story because there were things that I'd seen in Blackstone in the very first instance 12 years ago. But maybe you think there's more here and you just keep pulling the thread and suddenly the project's very big. Um, but I, there is not anything that I have come across in the founding materials that I've read, and I've read an awful lot, that would suggest that there's a dissensus about the term executive power. But beyond that, what the executive should get to do, boy, they disagreed about everything, and it's massively contentious what kind of powers the president should get. It's a high stakes question. It, pushes on all these buttons around fear of power and centralization on the one hand, um, desire for a more effective and focused uh, government after the chaos of the 80s on the other hand, um, boy, there's no consensus at all, that's for sure. So then what you do, at least from my perspective, if circling back to my disagreement with Jonathan and uh, John, is you look at the document when you're asking whether the president can do something and either it's in one of those more explicit, more express, whatever the right word is, uh, uh, clauses, the pardon power or what have you, or it's something the president told that he or she can do by statute and can perform via the executive power. This leaves the president with very, 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 very thin powers on day one, very little. But boy, and here's another fight that I've gotten into, it turns out that that allows very, very broad delegations. Not going to make Professor Werman uh, mad at me. Very, very broad delegations of authority, right? So we have a, a, a presidency with an enormous latent power, the executive power, that can put him or her in a position of doing all manner of things, running all manner of organizations, but a president who on day one has very, very little power. And so, I've talked more about the background, but it's probably useful to the extent that folks read the paper. I've talked more about the background now than the particular little snippets that I've um, circulated for discussion. What this would predict, what this um, argument, if it's right, would predict, would be a president in the 1790s who would not respond to emergencies by freelancing and pushing aside the structural uh, arrangement that was created by Congress by claiming an inherent um, prerogative of one sort or another to deal with stuff that wasn't anticipated. This would predict a president who would look to the coordinate branches of government, in particular to Congress, for approval ex ante, approval simultaneously, confirmation that what he or she had done was in fact valid within the scope of the statutory provisions that, that Washington was relying on, and my argument is that both the Whiskey Rebellion and the Neutrality Proclamation, which strangely to me, and again I came to this with some surprise at what seems to surface pretty plainly to me, have traditionally been thought of as displaying evidence for the sort of, I don't want to say aggressive, for the um, very strong view of the vesting clause, right? A president with lots of authority to really throw his weight around and to simply do what had to be done. I think to the contrary, both of those display a president who's claiming very little power, absent reference to something from Congress, some authorization from Congress. There's obviously lots more to say, but that basically sketches the, the argument and um, how the, the paper speaks to the framework. Oh, I was just going to give you the two-minute warning, oh. but you beat me to it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I tried to be good. <laughs> All right. I think we should have some conversation amongst the three other panelists here, then there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments from the floor. When we get to that point in the proceedings, if you will please go to a microphone uh, to uh, pose your question or make your comment. But let's, uh, let's let our panelists discuss it a bit amongst themselves. Uh, if I can start, I'd like to lay out what I think is the ground of disagreement between uh, Julian and myself and why uh, I'm not persuaded. Uh, so what I think is that First of all, what's in common is that I think both of us agree that the extent of presidential powers outside of the explicitly enumerated ones is, le is a political process. Uh, but he believes that uh, the president requires advanced delegation of authority by Congress before doing any of these things. 
I believe that the powers of an executive nature, and which I would like to stress just for clarification here, which does not include the power uh, to uh, deprive anyone of uh, any individual in this country of life, liberty, or property. So it doesn't mean making criminal laws, it doesn't mean uh, making uh, property laws. But as to many of the vast uh, uh, activities of government, uh, the president does not need to wait before exercising power of an executive nature, but it doesn't mean that he's absolute. What it means is that Congress is reactive and is able then uh, to pass laws pursuant to its uh, enumerated powers that are then superior to anything that the president has done. That's what I see as our, that's the general ground. Now why I'm not persuaded, I, I, <clears throat> I don't, I, so Julian says that he's not aware of any evidence that the framers used the term executive power to mean anything other than executing the law. Well, let me give you a conspicuous example, which is the Virginia Plan, which unmistakably uses the term, it uses the term executive rights, I don't know if that's, uh, but I, rights is obviously being used here as synonymous with power, it also talks about legislative rights for Congress, and, the le and what the Virginia Plan does is it gives the president two things. It gives him the power of carrying into execution the laws and the executive powers, the executive rights that had been vested in the article's government uh, under the Confederacy, which includes all kinds of things that are not executing the law. You know, coining money, doing the post office, foreign affairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the things that we would now say, um, uh, or what we argue about under the, the vesting clause. And it, it seems to me that when the entire constitutional convention is organized around the proposition that carrying the laws into execution is the core power of the president, and then you have all these other executive powers that we're fighting about, that it just doesn't, to my mind, make any sense to say that as a linguistic matter, there was a, a this 100% consensus that executive powers doesn't include anything other than uh, uh, carrying the law into execution. So that's why I'm not persuaded, and I think the conclusion from that is that the president can be a first mover with respect to this, these many things that are not enumerated, but that doesn't make him the ultimate mover, as, as you know, Hamilton says right, in, the, in his Pacificus, Pacificus essay, that the president moves first, but then uh, the, uh, the, the Congress can always exercise its powers when, they, uh, when Congress has powers that are relevant. Yeah, so it, it's some. So I want to I want to speak specifically to how I read the exchange in um, Philadelphia because I agree it's important. At some level, it is important to emphasize the background on which I'm drawing when I say this is what I'm seeing in the materials. I, just by way of methodology, for those of us, the, those of you all interested in methodology stuff, um, the, uh, the 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 origin of this project. I won't speak to the way I approach the background literature. But the way I approached the 1780s, 1770s materials in the first instance was to take advantage of what my colleague Don Herzog, this you know, wonderful early mod modern uh, political uh, theorist, political historian, calls basically cheating. I mean, he does it himself, and he says it feels like cheating. And back in the day, right, you'd spend all day looking for stuff like this. But I used stuff that's searchable online. And it turns out that there's an enormous quantity of materials relating to the 1780s and to the ratification of the, uh, of, of the Constitution that just right away is immediately searchable. The letters of the delegates of the Continental Con Congress, it's something like 10,000 pages. The letters, um, pardon me, the, the journals of the Continental Congress and the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution, which is something like 30 odd volumes. I don't know how many pages it is, but it's an enormous quantity of material. And I've read every single instance all of those doc, in all of those collections of the word EXEC. And so when, when, I, when, when I reflect to you um, my description of 
what executive power means, it's grounded in a very broad base of sources, and I believe a base of sources that's orders of magnitude beyond what others have done. For example, I take uh, Michael's book to focus really on the two, call it three volumes of Ferens. The, 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 the research base is, is very large, and I just want to register that as we talk about what's plausible and what's not. There's a number, I mean, Again, I refer everyone to the articles. I'd love for you to take a look at them because the amassing of evidence is, is the best argument here. Um, there's a number of how could you possibly explain moments, dozens of them, in the articles. But I want to turn to Michael's question because I actually think the Virginia plan demonst I mean, pr demonstrates precisely the opposite of what Michael claims. He's right. The plan includes the phrase, the granting to the president, of the executive rights vested in Congress. First thing you know is this is, not a, this is not a thing. I mean, it is a thing, but it's not a standard phrase, right? E executive power or the executive power, 100% a term of art. Executive rights, I, 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 can't, I couldn't find that combination of words anywhere else when I ran searches for it, try to figure out if there was some body of knowledge or some tradition of conversation that that phrase was drawing on. So this is an odd phrase that appears in a preliminary plan in the secret drafting history of the Constitution. Man, we're leaning a lot on that sort of um, aggressive reading of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an odd phrase and the parsing of how it relates to another phrase in the same sentence. But even if you accept, as I actually have come to, Michael's persuaded me, that you can read it, you, you could read this as a reference to the prerogative powers of the president. I, I'm not sure, given how Madison and Wilson, both of whom were major co-authors of the Virginia plan, respond that that can be right unless they're, completely unless they're completely lying. But I actually agree that on the face, the secret not seen by anybody else document, the sentence that Michael is relying on can be read to suggest that there's a distinction between executing the law and the executive powers of the president such that the executive powers has to mean the prerogative. I think there are other explanations, but set that aside. Mainly what I want to emphasize is the responses. Wilson and Madison, first of all, Pinckney, speaks up and says, guys, this really weird phrase we just used, he doesn't call it weird, but this is why he's reacting to it that way. This super weird phrase we just used, what's going on here? Like, are you saying that the president can, you know, start invasions himself? This is a little scary. And people who are core involved in the drafting of the document under discussion fairly leap to their feet to say, no, no, that's not what we meant at all. They don't say we, right? That, that would be in, indecorous. Um, but Wilson says that's not, that's not what this means. He did not consider, Wilson says, the prerogatives of the British monarch as a proper guide in defining the executive powers. And he goes on to include to that wonderful phrase, war and peace, et cetera. He says instead, there's only two strictly executive powers. Executing, quote, the laws, and appointing, quote, officers. After a bit more conversation, Madison stands up and says, obviously this is not what we meant. We didn't mean that we're gonna give the prerogative of the king, we've just left the king, and boy, it's gonna be a, a hard sell to the country already that's got all these anti-monarchical tropes to get this unitary president with enormous powers that are in fact more significant than the king's power. This is gonna be a big problem for us already. We definitely didn't mean the prerogative. Here's what I'll do. I think a quote definition of the extent of quote certain powers that are in their nature executive would be helpful. And what happens in the uh, uh, formulation that's then adopted is the same two powers that Wilson had said are the only things that are strictly executive in their nature, that is to say appointment and execution of law, are the only two things that are specified as part of a, quote, definition that one of the central co-authors of the plan on which not only Michael's, but the, but the school that Michael's sort of part of relies on so heavily, went out of his way along with his principal ally in drafting that same document to say, my goodness, no, you are completely misreading that. So 
I have, I, you know, you, you get really committed to a thesis, and it's like, I can't, oh, you can read executive uh, rights that way, was my sort of first reaction when I realized how heavily folks were relying on that. And that was affected by sort of a blind spot of just having spent so much time in the materials, and I know I'm going on too long, I apologize. I am now persuaded that you can indeed read that sentence in exactly the way that Michael suggests. It's a totally fair reading. In the larger context of one, reading a whole bunch of other stuff, and I mean a whole bunch. And two, knowing that Wilson and Madison were prime movers behind the Virginia plan, and leap up to say, no, 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 the best thing that you can get out of the exchange is that they were trying to sneak in the prerogative powers, but then they got caught, and they're like, oh, we didn't mean that. I think that's implausible, but that's the best case that the use of executive rights was intended to capture a broad range of prerogative authorities. In all instances, I am unpersuaded that that represents uh, evidence for an embrace of a vesting clause that conveys lots of powers to the president. Eric, would you care to mediate yes, this? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but maybe um, it, it, can I make, I mean, it, it might sound like a pedantic point, in, uh, and maybe it is, but I don't think it is, um, and I think it might be helpful. Um, and that is, um, that um, we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that the debate about the presidency and its powers and the debate about executive power are the same um, because, or coextensive, right? Uh, because what we're actually dealing with is a tradition of thought that goes back to the 17th century that sharply distinguishes these things. Um, so, you know, going back to uh, Charles I's answer to the 19 propositions, he says, look, um, you know, uh, th that there are two, that basically there are, um, in this country, uh, in this kingdom, law is made jointly by uh, the king, the peers, and the commons, um, but the government is the king's. And the gov and so this is a period in, I mean, it's for a, a period of about 100 years, the term government um, shades into the term executive. But, uh, but of course, what the king means is what would later be called the executive power. That is to say, uh, the execution of those laws, uh, the concomitant uh, powers of appointment, and all the rest. Uh, and his complaint is, by stripping me of my prerogatives, these flowers of my garland that are, you know, uh, as he says, um, you leave me only with the executive power, and that in a circumscribed fashion because they were requiring um, uh, advice and, you know, basically the permission of, uh, of the House of Commons for him to appoint counselors. They were requiring him to obey uh, the advice of his own counselors. Um, but um, the distinction between the, the purely executive part of the royal authority and the prerogative part was absolutely central. Uh, and um, now, the question of what actually fell in to uh, the, the, the executive part um, is admittedly very tricky, and there was, as far as I can see, very little in the way of consensus about this. Because, uh, and the the major, the major question, of course, was uh, concerning what Locke called the federative power. I mean, that's to say, this the the foreign affairs powers, uh, powers of war and peace, that were sort of neither strictly executive nor strictly legislative, but tended to be associated with. Uh, with executive power, were they properly to be regarded as part of or not part of? That is a major question. But the, but the fundamental structure that, it, it, is, that is important to keep in mind is that prerogative powers and executive powers are separate. Uh, and, uh, and the convention gives the president both kinds, right? So the, the executive power is one thing, but the veto is not an executive power, right? Uh, the, the, the veto is a prerogative power. Uh, it is, uh, it's the prerogative to participate in the process of legislation, which is not executive. Uh, the president is given other non-executive authorities and powers. Um, and so um, it's just, I think it's important to uh, remember that there are actually the sort of two debates going on here. One is about whether a proper chief magistrate in a Republican constitution should have any prerogative powers or should be what they all called a mere executive. Remember that the context is Charles I saying, you would make of me from a king of England a doge of Venice, right? I mean, if you, if you just left me with the executive power uh, and you took away the prerogatives. Um, and that's the view that's associated with Whiggism uh, and uh, particularly country Whiggism and radical Whiggism. Um, think of Cato's letters and all the others. Ideally, you want a king who reigns but doesn't rule, uh, who only executes um, uh, and, and doesn't even do that because that's through his appointees, let's say. 
Uh, and then you have others uh, who are pushing back and saying, no, what we want is a chief magistrate who's not a mere executive, uh, but also has independent prerogative powers um, that, are, uh, that are of a fundamentally different kind uh, and don't reduce. Now, you know, I don't want to pretend it's not very complicated because, for instance, sometimes people talk about the prerogative of appointment. Uh, and usually appointment is considered an executive power and sometimes the language of prerogative is used. Uh, but in general, I think it's a helpful distinction to keep in mind. Well, <clears throat> let me just remind us that um, what I said at the outset, we're still debating these issues 235 years later. Uh, it was his testimony to how ambiguously um, settled or unsettled they were at the time and have been ever since. And I'm reminded of a famous remark of someone about halfway on the pathway of time between 1787 and today, Woodrow Wilson, who said the president is free both in law and in conscience to be as big a man as he can be. So this, this is a deeply controversial element in our political culture and our political system and has been for a long time. Uh, I can feel the, uh, the emanations from the audience of the, the, the itch to speak and, uh, and interrogate. So please, uh, it's open up to discussion from the floor. Please go to a microphone uh, to uh, say whatever you're going to say. Jack Rako, not, not for the first time, is the first, <laughs> first interrogator. <laughs> so I've uh, got a quick comment for Julian and, uh, and a question for Eric. So, so Julian, just on the... The Wilson Madison thing, since uh, Madison, I think, is uh, pretty self conscious, pretty self consciously diffident about how much thought he's given to the executive going into the convention. My strong suspicion would be that when those guys are drafting the Virginia plan, which only takes place because the other delegations have not shown up, had the other, de had the other delegations shown up on time, the convention could well have proceeded in a very different fashion. So I think, I think between Wilson and Madison, is probably, my guess is it's more Wilson taking the lead and Madison starting to ruminate about it and that's what you see on June 1st. Eric, here's a question I want to put to you. I mean, in this audience, not surprisingly, um, uh, we're gonna hear a lot about Blackstone, you know, and Blackstone's relevance as a kind of primary source or a kind of fundamental source for the founding generation, broadly speaking. But since you invoke Locke on Fetter of Power, uh, and I'm a big fan of Locke, a variety of reasons. Um, it seems to me Locke's chapter on prerogative is, uh, I won't say sadly neglected, but in some ways is underappreciated in this sense. Everybody likes to quote the beginning of that chapter because Locke makes the argument from necessity. Sometimes you have to act beyond the law, the law or even against that. So if you're a big believer in a vigorous executive power, Locke is, you know, Locke is, you know, Locke is useful in that respect. Uh, you, know, you just have to cut the executive some slack and, this, and this, you know, the, you know the, the city's burning down, you gotta pull somebody's house down to save the other buildings. Okay, that's fine. Um, but Locke goes on to make two further points that I, it seems to me to be underappreciated. The first, uh, you know, the, the second point he makes in, 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 in the whole chapter is, I think a rejoinder to the lawyers who are gonna be scrupulous as you guys are trying to be about what is and what is not prerogative and what are the sources. Locke says, on the whole, when the executive uses the prerogative properly for appropriate purposes, we're gonna cut him, him or her, uh, we're gonna cut the executive some slack. That's to say, uh, ex post, you will be able to know and to judge whether or not the prerogative has been used appropriately. And, you know, in a sense, that's a political judgment. And I think what's missing from this, because it's something I've written a lot about with the presidency, is the political dimensions of the origins of executive power. Uh, I haven't seen much about that. I mean, who, how the presidency actually could be elected, which is the issue that stumps the convention down to the very end. I, I don't know what the, the other contributors here think about that. I suspect not as much as they ought to be thinking. But anyway, Locke introduces a kind of political dimension how to think about the executive power and his program. But third, in the end, what Locke says in the concluding section of the chapter on prerogative is the legislature retains the right to, you know, to curtail it. I mean, that's to say the legislature can look at what has been claimed under, let's say, necessitarian uh, principles that the, you know, the executive has been compelled to do, you know, pro bono publico or whatever. Uh, but in the end, it should be subject to legislative 
restraint, which, you know, comes back to, you know, David's opening point about the difference between Article 1 and, you know, Article 2 and, 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 and so on. So I wonder where, you know, since you're, you know, I mean, you're, 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 you're deeply, I mean, it's nice that, that Julian is spending time in the 1770s and 1780s, which is pretty much where I spent my whole professional life, you know, myself. But I think, you know, to think about the, 17, the deeper 17th century background, you know, and not just the answer to the 19 propositions, but I think where Locke figures in the story strikes me as being an interesting to mention this. So I'm not sure I've quite posed a question, but I think I've opened up a topic that I'd be curious to hear your, you know, your reflections on. Go ahead. Uh, just very quickly, because um, I talked too long last time. Uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, Jack's comment prompts is probably the thing that my research is directed at right now, which is trying to think about how to deal with not how to deal with from a modern perspective implementing some kind of originalist understanding, but about how the people in the late 18th century would have thought to deal with emergencies in a world where they didn't give the president much power <laughs> inherently. Um, and part of the answer is necessary, necessary and proper clause and ex ante authorization statutes, the Calling Forth Act, and so forth. But part of the answer is, and this is, at first it really surprised me that I'm a little more used to it, there is a remarkably like phlegmatic response to executive officers breaking the law, at least sometimes. There's a tradition of sort of violate and ratify in which, and this, the political element's really important, right? And again, I think that Locke chapter is a great reference, great pivot to this, that where there's this idea that how do you deal with emergencies? Well, and it's bound up with at least some kinds of ideas, like, like gender politics, ideas about manhood and manliness, that, 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 that a true man and a true gentleman steps forward and takes the risk on himself to break the law because he had to. And so I'm knee deep in reading right now about uh, the 1766 grain crisis, which was widely reported on in uh, uh, North America, um, like really important controversy in about the, actions taken by the crown in imposing an embargo during a grain crisis that wasn't allowed under the statutory law, right? Sort of a classic law violation scheme. But that and other incidents that are similar to it downstream is where I'm living right now. I'll just read a quote that I think captures some of the ways in which this isn't, I mean, this is of course Locke, but it isn't just Locke. Can I say just Locke? It isn't just Locke sort of ruminating. It's either, I mean, I don't know that is it he who gives rise to it or he who's reflecting it? But it is a political practice that to a degree that I frankly find distressing because I don't like the idea of sort of calm executive law breaking, seems to be embedded as part of the regular political practice. Here's a standard formulation describing people who had broken an important law and then sought after the fact an indemnity from parliament, which is to say a review by parliament of the circumstances that had prompted them to break the laws. Um, the ministers stood forth in a manly way at their own risk to do the thing that had to be done that was illegal and trusted to their country for indemnity. They obtained it to the fullest extent from a grateful Senate as soon as Parliament met. The law was plain and positive, but the breach of it became meritorious, not lawful, meritorious from the necessity of the case for the salvation of the state. So I think that, that dynamic's really interesting to me because boy, does a very thin powered president create issues, especially on day one of a brand new republic. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona State. Oh. Thank you. Well, I was gonna say something quick. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Jack. Um, I yield the floor. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, um, I, I mean, very quick because it's such a rich subject and you're exactly right. I mean, the, the you know, it was, um, uh, I, was, I remember that when I was working on all of this, I was fascinated to see how Locke was being used and, uh, in, um, in the whole period, particularly in the imperial debates, because of course what was going on then was that the patriot writers were citing the chapter on prerogative, right, by way of making their argument about, um, you know, connection to the crown and the royal prerogative and why the king should revive the veto and whatever. And uh, the English pamphleteers like Knox are writing back saying, you know, lovely man, but shame about that chapter. He, ne you know, he, he never should have written that. So, um, so, th so he's, he's uh, you know, that chapter is, is front and center, but it's also weird. Uh, and that, you know, that's what you were getting at because of course what he wants, you know, the fundamental, I mean, the thing that everybody knows about it is um, this, this, um, using of, this use of the term in a very idiosyncratic sense, where prerogative means acting either in the absence of the, during the recess of the legislature, so in the silence of the law, or against the law in 
uh, in a moment of necessity. That isn't how the term was used, right? Um, and uh, and if you said to you know the English monarch, uh, you know, what are your prerogatives? He wouldn't have said, well, funny you should mention it, the right to act in the recess of the legislature. And, you know, he would have said, well, I have the negative voice, I have uh, the power of pardon, I have the power to create offices. I, you know, I've so he so the. Um, the use of the term, Locke's very narrow uh, use of the term to, to highlight this specific issue of what we would now call emergency powers, um, makes it a complicated text because um, people know that it's an idiosyncratic use of the term. But I mean, there's much more to say about it, but yeah. Please. Uh, Elon Werman from Arizona State um, University. I'm in a bit of an awkward position because I'm on the next panel presenting the, the, this, what I'm going to read from some of this paper that I'm presenting today, um, though I feel like I sh uh, should have been on, on this one to talk about this. As Julian and Michael know, I kind of think you're both wrong uh, about this, unsurprisingly. Uh, so I have a question for each of you. Uh, Julian, uh, you didn't talk about this today, but I know you recognize it in your paper. I mean, there are some examples where the executive power in the singular is used to refer to the stuff of prerogative, the stuff of Locke's federative power. Montesquieu uses it, Rutherford uses it, and the Essex result in Massachusetts uses it. The executive power is to marshal and command her militia and armies for defense to enforce the law and to carry into execution all the orders of the legislative powers. So there's at least some evidence that the executive power was used more broadly, and as you point out in your paper, it could be, you know, because these powers, including the prerogatives, were associated with the, the executive as an institution, and therefore these things became conflated into the executive power. Is it possible that the original public meaning evolved? And as of 1787 or 1788, that the executive power came to mean to include prerogatives? As you know, I think that's probably wrong, but that's sort of my a challenge to you. And Michael, my challenge to you is about the incorporation of the Bank of the United States. Uh, the power to erect corporations is a prerogative power listed in Blackstone that's not uh, listed in the Constitution. In the debate over the bank in 1791, Alexander Hamilton specifically says, in British history, this was the executive authority. In, but no one in the course of the debates over whether Congress had the power to incorporate the bank via the Necessary and Proper Clause said, well, obviously, the president already has this power. But under the residual view, wouldn't that have been an obvious argument to make if it was a prerogative of the king in Blackstone, that the, king, that the president already has the power to erect a uh, national bank, and no one made the argument, and isn't that strange? Yeah, so one first. Sure. Um, That'll give me time to try to figure out what the answer is. <laughs> uh, actually, very briefly this time, I won't respond to the Montesquieu um, uh, citation because it's devastating to my claim. No, not because it's devastating to my claim, but because it takes some doing, and there's like 10 pages in the first article that talk about it. I think you're, I, 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 I understand how that single sentence in isolation, sort of this, um, I mean, it, it's, it's cited everywhere by anybody who wants the president to have all the powers, can be read as a matter of like parsing textual grammar, et cetera, to mean um, a, a, a prerogative. I don't think it means that, and I don't think people understood it to mean that. But I agree very strongly with you that the phrase the executive power, because it can reasonably be read either as the power belonging to an executive, which takes you down a prerogative path, or the power to execute, which is the sort of real meaning of it, that, that it lends itself to semantic drift. And um, it's one of the things like, you know, Hamilton drives me crazy, but I also love him because he's so clever. One of the ways in which he pushes on this thing in Pacificus is to like pull out this phrase and say, hey, you know where this goes? But of course he pretends it's always been that way. And so I agree that it's plausible. I don't know, I haven't gone far enough down the road yet to speak confidently the way I feel fairly confident about the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, but it seems very plausible to me that you'd have drift such that over time, the executive power would accrete substantive things, maybe not literally discussed in terms of tracing them to the prerogative, but like, it, like, a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a vessel, a residuum. And indeed, by the way, that, that's how Jackson uses it. In Jackson, that is to say, Jackson in his Youngstown concurrence uses the executive power as this thing for his, um, I mean, Frankfurter does it too, but for his notion of custom and tradition. The stuff that's built up around the presidency, that means, you know, that is to say by repeated action and, and deference uh, and acceptance, 
the stuff that the presidency has done for a long time is because of the tradition that has developed around the presidency, right, the circularity, a gloss on the executive power. I'm now using Frankfurter's words, but that's how, that's how Jackson uses the executive power textually. That was not short. <laughs> <For you>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like first just to add something to the question put to Julian. I think the key thing that some of us may be forgetting here is that when Wilson speaks of uh, on, on June 1st, he's talking about, he, the term he uses is strictly executive, and I think we need to distinguish between the powers that are strictly executive, which meant the powers that, that have to be in the executive and can be no, nowhere else, versus the executive powers, which are powers that are, you know, might be assigned somewhere else. For example, all those prerogative powers that are given to Congress are executive, they're just not strictly, and I think there also are strictly legislative powers that cannot be uh, properly given uh, to the president, and there's some strictly judicial powers, but each of these branches then does, a f does some things which uh, go beyond that, and I think that explains, a l I, I think that explains the problem a little bit better. Maybe there's linguistic drift too, uh, there usually is, but I think that that explains a lot of this. Uh, as to incorporation of the bank, I think that the president's uh, residual executive powers are only those within the national government, the federal uh, government, and not that the, the prerogative powers of the king, uh, the king, excuse me, the residual powers of the president, I get them mixed up too, um, <laughs> the residual powers of the president are, don't uh, affect the federal state balance. And the big fight over the bank is whether the, uh, the national government is, can, can charter uh, a, a banks or not. And I think that really comes down to an argument over the reach of the necessary and proper clause, which is all in uh, Congress's uh, uh, bailiwick, not the president's. Yes, sir. Please identify yourself. And sure, I'm John McKyle from Georgetown. Just want to start by thanking all of the panelists for some very uh, interesting and instructive remarks. I have a question that any of you could address, but I think it's principally directed toward Michael because it, uh, it picks up on a couple of things he's uh, said today. It goes to this question of how we understand the reference to executive rights in Resolution 7. And I think I heard you suggest that your understanding is that by that term, the framers were referring to all of the former prerogatives that were enumerated in the articles. A, a genuine question I have is whether that's correct, and part of the question has to do with how we should understand the reference to legislative rights in Resolution 6. Um, and so I'm, because those powers, those former prerogatives that are enumerated in the articles, could on some readings be also considered legislative at that point in time. So I guess partly this goes to how we understand the Congress under the Articles of Confederation um, and whether the enumeration of former prerogatives was so clearly by 1787 uh, best characterized as executive rights or legislative rights. And I'm actually interested in what you think, Julian, and what you think, Eric. For my own part, I don't think I can understand what the meaning of executive rights in Resolution 7 is without an understanding of what legislative rights is referring to in Resolution 6. So I guess I'm just asking you, Michael, principally, but also the others, how you understand those terms operating in tandem in the Virginia plan. I think it's interesting that Julian points out that that wasn't a phrase, apparently. So, we don't have this kind of deep linguistic inquiry. Um, I think it's clear, I point this out in, in the paper that I'm gonna be discussing tomorrow, that all of these individuals were deeply active under the articles. They knew what they were talking about. We can't you know, assume that they didn't understand what they were referring to. But I'm genuinely um, unclear um, as to what each of you think they were referring to by those two terms, executive rights in Res Resolution 7 and legislative rights in Resolution 6, thanks. I guess it's put to me first. Uh, can I just clarify, do you, 
agree that the term rights is, synony is being used synonymously with powers? Yeah, I think for the sake of argument, I do. And, yeah, let's assume that's correct. And of course, a lot of Julian's point here is that when he looks at the word legislative rights, it's never used anywhere else. I totally agree with that. I have no idea why they use the term rights rather than powers. I don't have a theory about it, but I also don't think in the end that there is, I can't think of, a, of another possible meaning other than that they were just using an unusual synonym for right. So, so if we speak of executive powers, I agree with you, John, that you want to look at resolutions six and seven, and one refers to the, le they're basically, they're trying to allocate powers between the, the two, the Congress and the, what will be called the Congress and what will be called the President, uh, with as few words as possible, and they begin with the powers of the that are listed, enumerated, actually enumerated in the Articles of Confederation, in the Articles, as you know, they don't actually divide them that these are the executive ones and these are the legislative ones. They're just all listed. Some of them are executive, and some of them, and one of them at least is is judicial, which is has to do with the competing land claims of uh, of different states. Uh, I just think. And, and then we don't know, if, how do we answer your question? We know only two, we have two pieces of data. We know that they understood the power of peace and the power of war as being executive rights that had been held by Congress under the Articles. We don't know about any of the rest of it other than the ampersand, the et cetera. I love the et cetera, uh, but I think that what this, my guess, and, and uh, it's, it's, this is speculation, but I think it's quite plausible, is that as in a first approximation, they look at the list and the things that were done by the king were probably executive, the things that would, be, would have been done by the parliament were probably legislative, and I bet they didn't think about it any more deeply than that. Um. Two points. The first is one of the things that I have some almost self-consciousness about is how this thing that I think I've uncovered about how they talked about this area of the law is actually embarrassingly simple. There's not a whole lot of theory that has to happen with talking about what legislative power is and what executive power is. Legislative power is the formulation of the thought and the instruction in an authoritative way. Executive power is making it happen. And you can describe the same action in both ways. It's an incredibly thin set of terminologies that persists across many, many, many discussions, such that my answer to you is like a thin answer. The executive powers, strictly speaking, I'm saying powers, let's say executive rights, that would have been referred to there if somebody was really working it to read it as a finely enacted piece of text would be those that are related to execution, to doing the thing. Um, uh, uh, ex executing, which is also elsewhere mentioned, but also appointing possibly removing, I don't tend to think so, but maybe they were thinking of removing. Depends on how you read Madison's evolving position over time. More importantly, the legislative powers of the Continental Congress is like every time it's allowed to make a rule that holds and instructs validly, either by way of authorizing or prohibiting. All of it is legislative power. The only stuff is the executive is when, and they did this, and a startling number of people making these arguments don't realize that the executive pardon me, the Continental Congress, did do a fair amount of executing. They absolutely did have the executive power. Um, and that would be my answer. The second thing I say is, uh, drafting is really, really hard. I teach legislation and regulation and admin. This is one of like the slides that I put up every year multiple times in talking about what interpretation looks like. It is extremely hard to draft in a way that is bulletproof, non-redundant, et cetera, at the front end. And I'm now circling back to Professor Rakoff's comments. Um, that is one of the many reasons that I think it is, a, um, it is a historical mistake to lean too heavily on a close parsing of this tentative document that both sort of principal actors forswore as soon as it was pointed out. Anybody who's been in a drafting process in this room, I bet, knows the kind of thing I'm talking about. Jed Sugarman. Great. Uh, this is a terrific panel. And, uh, I think this is, you know, this is the goal of having uh, these these kinds of uh, exchanges and debates. I think there's a remarkable degree of consensus across this panel uh, that to the as a kind of 
uh, centrism of seeing a Republican prerogative, identifying, that I would identify all of you as prerogativists uh, in that the relevance of the royal prerogative was germane, was, was part of the, their consensus um, and just how to, how to deal with it. I think, the, I think the disagreement on the panel is about, and Julian, I think you framed it this way, is about the significance of enumeration. Uh, and so uh, each of you, I think, has focused on June 1st. And I, I maybe just focus a little bit more on the particular debate in Rufus King's notes um, on this question of beyond prerogative, the question of enumeration, right? So there's this debate where Wilson says about this secrecy, vigor, and dispatch. And then King records Madison saying, and, and this is explicit, I think all three of you identify this day as important. Madison agrees with Wilson in, in his definition of executive powers. Executive powers, X v termini, and then he explains to Rufus King and continues, do not include rights of war and peace, et cetera, but the powers should be confined and defined. That's what ex v termini means, is, is, is by the termination or by the definition. This is, a, this is a clear statement of enumerationism of powers and not implied, uh, not implied powers. And to the extent that, um, you know, Michael, you focused on the committee of detail later, um, there was an opportunity where the committee of detail filled in gaps like a for Article I, like a necessary and proper clause. They did not include something like a necessary proper clause for Article II. So I guess I, one question I have for all three of you is um, this, this precise question of being confined and defined to the powers listed. And I think I wanna give Michael an opportunity, given that removal was not uh, listed in Blackstone's list of prerogatives. I guess I want, uh, with, with this opportunity on you on the panel, I'd like to um, uh, give you an opportunity to identify what's the basis for the removal power if it is if it was not among the lists of, of royal prerogatives. Uh, so I take it that Rufus King's report is actually pretty very similar to Madison's own and the, uh, the Latin phrase via termini, is that what it is, means uh, by, by the very nature of the word, that is the only power that's just actually communicated by the word itself. And I take it that that's synonymous with strictly executive. And I think Madison is probably distinguishing here between powers that are sort of have to be executive versus powers that more loosely speaking are, are executive. And so, uh, I think that makes sense of, so that brings Madison into the same camp uh, with Wilson. Uh, I don't, by the way, don't, I, a mild disagreement with Julian is he, he interprets these statements as being denials that that is what we meant. Well, I, the way I read this is, is they're actually looking at this and saying, oh, uh-oh, look what we did. We need to change that, and so each of them you know, make, each of them seeks to change the language of Resolution 7. It isn't denying that the problem is there. I think they recognize that as a linguistic matter when they speak of the executive rights of the articles that they have, that that isn't actually what they agree with. It's, so they realize they made a mistake by their own lights, a mistake that then gets corrected by the Committee of Detail. Now, I have specific uh, removal, but uh, uh, Professor Sugarman is, is uh, uh, pointing me to uh, an, a discussion we had about the book in which he's persuaded me that I made a mistake. Um, that is, I had, so Blackstone speaks of the power of removal in the king, and I had interpreted that as being, meaning a prerogative power of the king, and I no longer think that that's true. I mean, Jed, is the, Jed, Jed has persuaded me that Blackstone, although treating this as a power of the king, does not actually include it in his list of, uh, of prerogative powers. And I'm especially grateful because I have a whole paragraph in the book in which I just comment on how weird it is since they seem to be allocating every single listed prerogative. And I say in the book, I don't have any explanation for why they didn't uh, uh, allocate this one. Why wouldn't they? There doesn't seem to be any good reason for it. Jed has provided a good reason, which is actually, it was a power, but not a prerogative power. And, and if their methodology was to go through and allocate all the prerogative powers, well, that's a, a nice explanation. Where does it come from? Uh, he asks. And it seems to me that is a as a non-prerogative power, that is one that is subject to 
being uh, defeased by action of Congress, it would be under the vesting clause, but that the take care clause uh, is also referred to by Madison and Fisher Ames and others uh, in the removal debate. And since the take care clause is a duty of the president, which implies a power of the president, Congress cannot take away an essential tool that, is, that the president needs in order to be able to discharge the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And that's why I think that that uh, is actually an indefeasible power not because it's one of the prerogatives that's in the vesting clause, but because it f is a necessary tool in order to carry out the duty imposed by the, uh, uh, by the take care clause. Julian, Eric, do you have any final thoughts? Nothing for me, I don't think. And I'm gonna exercise the prerogative of, as the moderator to make uh, two very brief final observations. Uh, to my 21st century ear, uh, there is a connotative difference between the words rights and powers. And I don't know if this migrates back to the 18th century distinction between the two, but to my modern ear at least, I think rights are something more fundamental and inherent than powers. Powers can be taken or given away, but rights are something, at least to my ear, modern thinking about it, uh, it's, a, it's a more deeply grounded, substantiated uh, matter. That leads me to a final observation, uh, just about something that I think uh, an ambient consideration around all of this discussion, not just about Article Two and its 13 paragraphs, but about the entire constitutional document and moment. And I'm thinking here of a passage uh, in Henry Adams' writing, I think it's somewhere in the eight volumes of the history of the United States during the administrations of Jefferson and Madison, and it might be elsewhere. But he says something to the effect that the great fear of the people in the 13 colonies as they began to establish their own independent republic, their great fear was power. Power whether in the hands of one master or many, power in the hands of a legislature or an executive, power in whatever form, shape, substance it might manifest itself, that was their great power, their great fear. And I think we've seen the extent to which that fear actually colored the debate about uh, the power or the prerogatives or the rights of the executive, but it, I think it suffuses the entire document and that entire moment in the evolution of our own political culture. With that, I'll say thanks to the panelists. It's been my privilege to be up here with you. Thanks to all of you for your interest. And I think we've now arrived at the crucial moment when it's time for lunch.